Last week we started a brand new series called Coming Out of Quarantine. And if you uh, heard it, if you had a chance to hear it, we talked about the fact that courage comes from somewhere because courage needs a connection. Uh, we all want to be courageous, but in the Bible especially, uh, courage comes from God. There's this connection between God and a person that gives courage, that relationship to God as well as his promises. And I thought it, I thought it was such an uh, interesting thing to see this connection. And then when you see this connection and you look to God and you say, God, I need courage. Because we, we looked at the life of Joshua in the Old Testament. We started looking at, at uh, what God was calling Joshua to do. Um, he was bringing the Israelites uh, out of Egypt. Uh, Moses had brought them out. And they'd wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. And that was his job to take them into this new land, the promised land. But it would not be without struggles and difficulties. Uh, there were enemies there. And it would be very easy for them to become fearful and not find the courage that they need to take this on. So all of a sudden I realized uh, in studying this that there's this connection between courage and fear itself. In fact, it's one of those things culturally I know that we talk about uh, that we're not supposed to have any fear. Find a way to get rid of all of your fears. You remember the, uh, the famous statement by one of our past presidents, uh, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. And it would make you think then that fear itself is the enemy and all fears need to be eliminated. But if you look at, at, in the Bible at the relationship that God had with the people, that actually wasn't true. There was a place for fear. There was a, there was a place where fear fit. In fact, it wasn't just, it wasn't the absence of fear that, were, that was the problem for most people. It was that they, they feared the wrong things. And when you fear the wrong things, what happens, especially in this story, is you stay in quarantine. You don't, you don't move to the promised land. If you eliminate all fear, then you eliminate the one that you should fear, God himself, who is able to take you into uh, those places. I know that it's also Mother's Day, and um, so as I was preparing for Mother's Day and thinking about it, the one thing I remembered about my mom, uh, I remember you know so much about her, but something that may sound a little strange to you, my mom was fierce. She was. She was someone to be feared as well as to be loved um, and to be thought well of, but there was, there was something about being a mom and who she was that she, uh, she personified a certain amount of awesomeness about who she was. Her, her knowledge, I mean, she was definitely growing up, she was bigger and stronger than we were. So there was a certain amount of fear that we had of her. Um, if you were around her and you took on her children, you, you were a threat to her children, you found out how this lovely, beautiful woman uh, could be fierce as a, as a mama mountain lion, you know, because she was going to protect her crew. But at the same time, as one of her children, we also knew that she was going to guide her crew. And, and she was fierce in that way also. She wanted to make sure that we learned the right things and we avoided the wrong things. That our lives had certain qualities and characteristics to them that there was a certain respect in our lives for the things that mattered and the things that should be respected. And when we cross those lines, listen, you know, mom was fierce. I mean, she was someone to be feared. Uh, I remember a uh, story that I was told, I guess I was too young to remember it or, or I wasn't there. But there was a time that a man in the community uh, who was known to be loud, uh, aggressive, um, he was someone that was of, uh, not highly respected, and um, he decided for some reason he was angry at my dad. And uh, what, rather than go and confront my dad at his office, he decided he was going to confront him on something. Uh, he decided to show up at our house to confront my dad. My dad wasn't there. He was a doctor. He was either um, at the hospital or he was at his office. And so he showed up at my house. And I, I didn't get a chance to see it myself and hear it myself, but I, I heard it from other relatives that were there. They said, when my mom uh, opened the door and there he was, and loud and aggressive, boy, she took him on. In, in a way that was very uncharacteristic of her, but she was not going to let someone show up at her home and uh, attack her husband 
in the, in the middle of her family and her children, and she took him on. She was that way at games. Uh, I can remember growing up and being at football games that I played in or baseball. Or, boy, she, was, she was my greatest fan. And yet, at the same time, she was fierce as far as pulling for us and, and uh, cheering for us uh, at the same time. My mom, um, she was also very steady. Uh, when we were, uh, as we grew up, we learned to fish. And uh, there was another doctor who was going to teach us all how to fly fish. So we had fly rods, we were out in boats, and it was quite a fiasco this one summer as we were popping lines around, we were, we were working on the art of fly fishing and uh, hooking one another and, and saying, look out. And, and, and so it was, it was quite an entertaining time for about three or four hours out in the boats. And as we came back, my mom was on the shore where she had been, and she had simply a cane pole, a hook with some worms, and a bob. And as we pulled up, you know, we had a great time and a, a, a great experience, but we had very few fish. My mom had a huge string of fish, her patience, her steadiness. And in that way, we thought, you know, she's actually better than we are. We, we, we thought we had all this new technology, and oh, man, she just did so much better than we did. When my uh, daughter, when she got married, um, my son-in-law, his grandfather, uh, my wife and I, we went and we decided to... Uh, uh, get to know him. We spent a lot of time with him. He was about 90 years old, and he was just a lot of fun. But one time we asked him, we said, so what do you think of our daughter? And he did this. He went, ah, like that. We were like, what? He said, she's like my daughter. My daughter was so sweet before she had all of those kids. And her, his daughter had six children. And of course, you know, we thought, well, hey, you get six kids, uh, you, you turn from sweet to you've got to be fierce. Uh, you have to protect them. You have to train them. You have to raise them up. There's so much going on. Uh, there's this adaptiveness that you have to take on if you're going to make this work. Uh, I think it's true uh, in our lives also. We, we, we tend to think if just all my fears were eliminated. But there is actually a way for you to find strength in a, in a new fear, a different fear, that, that finds a place in your life that it should find in your life. And this is really what the Bible talks about. In fact, if you remember, uh, in the book of Proverbs, in the very first chapter, there's this one verse. It, it, it says, uh, to fear the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Or let me read it. This is from uh, a, a different, a more, more modern translation. And uh, I think that it, it might help you to catch it. It says, knowledge begins with respect for the Lord, but fools hate wisdom, and self-control. So he, he's actually putting this fear of God as the beginning of understanding life. It is foundational. And, and you need this fear of God in your life. If you don't, you will reject the things that you really need. You'll reject self-control. Um, you'll re reject, as he said, wisdom. In fact, you'll, you'll tend to look at those things and despise those things all because you lack this foundational fear of God himself. It, it's not fear in the sense that you think God is out to get you. It's, it's fear in the sense that you realize who God is. You understand what he's capable of, and you have this great respect for him. In the same way, I, I had this great respect for my mom. I loved her. I knew how much she loved us, but I knew better than to, that it was not a good idea to cross her or to go against her in certain things because she was in control and she was going to move her family in a direction that she knew that that family should be moved. And, uh, and that, that foundation of that fear of her, that respect for her, was central in my education, in my growth, in everything about my life. The writer of Proverbs is saying the same thing with God. Without that as the foundational part of your life, you're, you're going to fall into all sorts of other fears in life. So many other things are going to take over and take control of your life, and you're going to take on things that you should not fear, things that, that are holding you back, all because you've lost the most important fear, the central fear that you should have uh, in life. Um, so let me take you to, this is uh, uh, Jacob, I mean Joseph and um, Caleb's life. But um, rather than going to the book of Joseph that we went, Joseph, Joshua, that we did last week, 
I want to take you all the way back to the book of Numbers. So this is where um, Israel has come out of Egypt, and they've been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. And in those 40 years, God has been disciplining them. Uh, this is like a time of quarantine for them. He's trying to uh, teach them. The reason they're having to wander for 40 years is because they have not respected and trusted and, yes, feared God. They, they feared the nations around them. They feared the obstacles they would have to overcome more than they feared going against God, not trusting God, not doing the things that God wanted them to do. And so there came a time where it was, they'd gone for 40 years, and it, and, and it was time to go into the promised land. And in the book of Numbers, it says that they took one leader from each of the tribes. So 12 men. Uh, these were smart men. They were uh, men of, of great capability. Uh, they weren't just anyone, and they gathered these people together. Two of them were Joshua and Caleb. The 12 were sent into this land, and for 40 days, they go through the land, the promised land, to different cities. Uh, they see the people. Uh, they, they examine everything, and it was their job to, to figure out who the people were that lived in all of these areas, uh, what their lives were like, what the cities were like, uh, were they warriors, you know, what was there to understand about them, and then to look at the land and say, is it a good land? Is it a place that, that we want to spend the rest of our lives, you know, as God has promised us? And they came out thinking, it's a beautiful land, it's a wonderful land prosperous land. They brought back things to the people of Israel who were down in the lower part in the desert, in the wilderness, waiting and showed them. But they also came back fearful, or at least 10 of them did. And here's what it says. This is in Numbers chapter uh, number 13. It says, uh, but Caleb, so when it speaks of Caleb, it, it does not speak of Joshua here, but it was speaking of Joshua before. So Caleb is speaking for he and Joshua, but Caleb tried to quiet the people as they stood before Moses. And here's what he says. Let's go at once and take the land, he said. We will certainly conquer it. Now, here's the question. Why was Caleb so enthusiastic and why was he so confident? Why was Joshua so confident that they would take the land also? It was because of what God had promised. They looked at it as this is the land that God has given us. God has been with us. He has been our strength. He is absolutely our courage as we go in here. We fear him. We respect him more than those that we will go up uh, against in the land. We, you know, when you look at other people in the Bible, you look at David. This is how David took on Goliath. As he goes out to battle Goliath, he looks at Goliath and he says, you come at me with spear and sword. You know, he's a great giant and all of his, army, his, his armor but he said, but I come to you in the name of the Lord God. So it's, it's not that he was, you know, uh, had some kind of secret weapon in God. It was just that's where his confidence was. That's where his strength was. That's where David's fear was. And his fear of God, this healthy fear, this healthy respect, caused him not to fear Goliath and all the things that, that he had at his disposal. So you might say, well, in that sense, it was like a secret weapon. Well, it was, as far as his relationship with God and how he would approach everything else, because he had this trust in God. And it was very different than all the armies of Israel. All the armies of Israel were cowered back, afraid of the Philistines, afraid of Goliath. Not David, because of how he saw, and yes, how he feared and how he respected the Lord God who had called him to uh, to do this and would call him to so many other things uh, in his life. So here's what it says in the next verse in um, Numbers chapter 13, verse 31. It says, but the other men, now these are the other 10 who had explored the land, disagreed with him. We can't go up against them. They are stronger than we are. So they spread this bad report uh, about the land among the Israelites the land we travel through and explored will devour anyone who goes to live there. All the people we saw were huge. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. Next to them, we felt like grasshoppers. And that's how they thought of us, too. You see how they took on the, the, the fear of those around them. They looked at them, and, and certainly as they would travel through the cities, 
Uh, they saw warriors. They saw men bigger than they were. They saw resources that they had. And, and as it says, we felt like, here's how we viewed ourselves. We felt like we were just grasshoppers in their midst. And then, of course, they projected that on them also. That's how they saw us. So this fear consumed them. Why didn't it consume Jacob? Why didn't it consume Joshua? Because Joshua and, and Caleb, did I say Jacob again? Joshua and Caleb saw God differently. They saw God as bigger than all of those who lived in the land, bigger than the giants, bigger than the cities, bigger than the warriors. That was their trust. Yes, that was their fear. They, they looked at God as, I don't want to upset him. I don't want to go against him. So I'll go against them instead because God has called us to go against them. And sort of like when my mom was with us growing up, there was a, there was a confidence and a strength and a boldness because she was there. We knew who she was. She was someone to be feared. And so we took on part of her, her, own, her strength in our lives as we would act out things. Um, that's exactly what they do. There's this wonderful story in the New Testament where Jesus is uh, with his disciples and he goes out on the, on the uh, Sea of Galilee, I think it was, and this is in uh, Mark chapter number four. And this is what it says in verse 35. As evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross over to the other side of the lake. And they took Jesus in a boat and started out, leaving the crowds behind, although other boats followed. But soon, catch this, a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat, and it began to fill with water. Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat and his head, with his head on a cushion. The disciples woke him, shouting, Teacher, don't you care that we are going to drown? When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the water, Silence, be still. Suddenly, the wind stopped. And there was a great calm. Then he asked them, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? The disciples were absolutely, catch this, terrified. Who is this man, they ask each other. Even the wind and the waves obey him. That's a wonderful question, isn't it? Jesus asking them, why are you afraid? Because the, the naturalness of the fear of a storm and they're out in a boat, all of us would think, well, because we could drown, we could lose our lives. That's how they felt. And they felt as if Jesus didn't care because Jesus somehow is able to continue to sleep in the midst of this storm. There's a calm about Jesus' life and a security about who he was that they did not understand. They, they actually take it the wrong way. And so when they challenge Jesus on this, Jesus speaks to the wind and the waves. He calms the storm and he looks at them and he asks them this question. What has happened to your faith? It, what is Jesus saying? He's saying, do you not understand that I'm bigger than the storm? Do you not understand that everything um, that, that comes against you it, is not something that I can't handle? It, it will obey me. It will, it will do what I said. This, this was who Jesus was. And this is why it says that this language is they're more terrified of Jesus now than they were of the storm because they've never seen a man like this who could do these things. It, it's a good fear. It's a good terror to understand how powerful he is. And that as I put my hope and my trust in him and I follow him, listen, nothing, nothing is greater than he is. Nothing can overtake him in life. Jesus even said, it's a, you find this in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, don't fear the one who can take your life. Fear the one who can take your life and more than that can take even your soul. God is much more powerful than anything we face. And when we put our, our fear in him, our respect in him, it's not just looking to God and saying, God, thank you for your love. Give me good things. Now I'll go off and do whatever I want. It, it, it's a healthy fear, a healthy respect for who God is, for the plans that God has, what God wants from you and from me in life. Because God's plans will succeed. God's ways always work. It's because he's God. It, it, it is just like being around for me, my mom. I, I knew that mom knew better what to do than I did. 
I knew mom brought protection. But I also knew that mom brought direction in our lives too. She was going to move us in a certain direction and teach us certain things so that we would be bigger and better and stronger because she also knew one day uh, we would be parents also. We would be those who would, uh, just like Joshua and Caleb, who would have to take the lead also. So if we learned a healthy fear, a healthy respect, it would be a strength for us going up against the things that we should not fear that were really minor, the things that would hold us in quarantine, that would keep us there, that would stop us from moving into the, th- the land, the, the places, the things that God has promised to us. We didn't want, she didn't want us to, to be held back by smaller fears, no more than God wants you to be held back by smaller fears. And the way to, to combat that, the way to overcome that, is with a, a greater fear in life. Uh, in 1 John, this will make this uh, make sense to you. Uh, I know that you may be even, some of you may know this verse and be thinking of it. Uh, this is where John writes, he says, such love has no fear. So it, doesn't that mean that you should not have any fears at all? Hang on. Such love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. If we are afraid, it is for fear of punishment. And this shows that uh, we have not fully experienced his perfect love. So this is what he's saying about this kind of fear. He, he is saying that once we understand how much God loves us and who God is, and we've experienced this love in our lives, and we learn to imitate this love because God teaches us this same kind of love, the fear of punishment before God leaves us because we understand that God takes us through these things. He builds into us his own kind of love and his own kind of life so that those things would not hold us back. It's, it's actually, I know that he uses the word fear, that's what he means, but it's actually as if God's fear controls us, as well as his love. This respect that we have for him, it controls us. And when it does, and we understand how much God cares for us, it dispels all of the other fears in our life. And that's, that's what he's talking about. If, if all those other fears don't get pushed out of our life, by God, it, it shows that it, we haven't experienced it. We just don't understand who God is. We don't hold him in the right place, the right respect in our lives. One, one last little thing I, I thought of. Um, how do you live a totally fearless life? Because uh, most of us say, well, that's what I want. I want to live a, a, a life where I fear nothing. So I thought about it. There's only two ways you could live a totally fearless life in the sense of all the things around you. One is, if, if you were big and strong enough, great enough to take on everything in life, there was nothing greater, bigger, stronger than, than you are, then, then you would fear nothing. The problem with that is none of us are that way. Now, now, we may want to be that way, and maybe we think, you know, there's, there's this idea if you just eliminate fear in your life, then nothing will be bigger and stronger than you are, and that's certainly not, not true. But here would be the other way to live a fearless life. Know the one who is bigger and greater and stronger than all of the fears in life. Be close to the one who is bigger and greater and stronger than all of the things that that we fear in life. Put it in another way. Fear the one who is bigger and greater and stronger than all of those things that we fear in life. And he becomes our Lord, our King, our Savior, our champion. We fear Him, we follow Him, we trust Him, and He watches after us, and He guides us through life. Sort of like your mom did. Sort of like your parent took you through life. And you had a great confidence in them that they knew what to do, that they would be your strength, and they would guide you through these things because they could handle anything. God is like that in life. So this this fear that we have of him is a healthy fear. It is a good thing for us. It only makes our lives stronger. Would you pray with me as we remember? You might remember your mom. Uh, For me, my mom passed away almost a year and a half ago. And uh, as I still remember her, I think wonderful thoughts about her, all that she took on and all that she did in order to raise uh, my brother, my sister, and I. And um, 
Also remembering that in a way she is a reflection of God's strength and a, a way for you to, to overcome and for you to move on and for you to take on the same characteristics as you raise, influence other people in your life. Let's go and let's thank God. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that um, you watch after us. You put people in our lives who, who want to strengthen us and to build into us good, healthy things. And Lord, part of that is a good, healthy fear of the things that we should fear and respect in life that make us strong and make us able to overcome the lesser things, the things that we should not fear in life. Father, we thank you that you have become our strength, that drawing close to you, allowing you to pull our hearts close to you, uh, you separate and you show us the things that matter, that don't matter, the things that we, we, we should not cower to, and yet at the thing, same time, the things that we should bow down to and, and show great respect to the things of you and who you are because you're the one who watches after our life. Father, I thank you that you sent your son Jesus into the world to show us what real faith looks like and what real faith can do because of what he can do because of what you can do in our lives. If you're listening to this and you've never put your hope and your trust in Jesus Christ, maybe you've tried to take on the world all by yourself. Maybe you're listening to this today and there are things in your life that, that you know you shouldn't fear. But somehow those things have just taken a hold of you. They have a grip on you and you just can't break that grip. The, the thing that I would hope that you would understand as we pray is that Jesus Christ can. But it means giving your heart to him. It means having a certain fear and respect for who he is, just like the disciples learned to have that same fear and respect. He just called it faith. That's what it is. It's, it's believing in him and trusting in him, knowing that he knows the right way. And also knowing that he will correct he will guide. He will lead because of his great love. And that that great love that Jesus has for you will cast out, will push out those other fears in your life. He takes over uh, he, when, he, when he takes the primary spot. So Lord Jesus, come fill our hearts. We want to follow you. We want to know you. We want to put our hope and our trust in you. Yes, we want a healthy fear of who you are so that the things that we have a tendency to fear in this world, don't have a hold of us. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.